One thing uh, you d once told me about the, the editing this film is I think you had gone through a pass of the edit yourself and, uh, and felt like you'd been kind of hard on yourself. And then you hand it over to uh, another editor who said, no, you could be a lot harder on yourself. Right? <laughs> well, y y you know, well, what was interesting, Bill Hogsey, who w also was one of the editors with me on Hoop Dreams and, and with Frederick Marx, and um, Bill, when I, sh yeah, when I showed the um, cut to him at that point, you know, um, it was, uh, you know, three hours and 20 minutes or something. And I, I didn't think it was done. Um, but, but I said, you know, here you go. And he looked at it and he said, well, I'd like to go back to the dailies. And I went, well, why would you want to go back to the dailies? I mean, you know, like, don't you think that he goes, no, no, it's, it's fine. But I want to see everything you left out. And, um, and one of the most, it, he, there were two things. I mean, there were many things that he contributed, but two things that stick out in my mind to this point. One was, he felt like the narration, there were times when I was um, actually taking myself more to task for having um, made the film, in the film. And he said, you know, that's great that you take yourself to task, but you're doing it so much it, sa it seems more like a backdoor attempt at sympathy, which I thought was a really, really insightful comment. And then my other favorite Bill Hogsey story is, is that when he saw the scene with the Aryan Brotherhood guys around the truck, my version of that story, my version of that uh, scene had everything except me stumbling all around and being completely undone by that guy. And, and, and it was the weirdest thing because when I got in the edit room to start to cut it, I had no recollection of how he had done that to me. It was amazing. I had no recollection. And so I ended up cutting the scene the way I remembered it instead of what was in the footage. And when he got a hold of it, when Bill got a hold of it, and he showed me the scene. I was like, okay, yeah, that's the scene. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what, uh, what was Wendy, the mother of the victim, thinking when she let him stay with her child? I did ask her that. Um, and what she said was is that every time she'd been around Stevie, she had seen this sort of tender side of him, which you do see some in the film. That and, and he had always been really great at playing with her daughter in, she felt, in a very appropriate way. And... And she, uh, you know, I don't know, I mean, this is what she told me, I don't know, I mean, I think there's some real question here, but she always said, she said that she had never been clued into some of the other stuff that he had been doing. Uh, it's true that people, Brenda had never, until this crime happened, Brenda had never really spoken to anyone about having been sexually abused by him when they were children. That's, I, I know that to be true from Brenda. Um, so I think because she didn't live in the area, which is probably a detail that you don't get from the film. She didn't live right in that neighborhood, I mean, in that in the in Pomona. Um, her contact with Stevie was sporadic, and um, and so when this happened, um, she claimed that she she really didn't know uh, until it happened, and then all the stuff about him started to come out that she she was uh, she said she was unaware of. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in showing films before they're done to the main subjects um, and not like right before they're done as in um, we're mixing this film next week and I just wanted you to see it before it's completely done. But when you can actually still do something, if they tell you something that you think is imp imp you know, relevant to, to and worthy of, of addressing. Um, and so um, Wendy... Wendy saw the film, um, and she felt fine about the film. Uh, she wasn't sure she wanted her daughter to see it for a while, um, and and I don't. I've lost touch with Wendy, so I don't know what her daughter's reaction ultimately to the film was. Um, but at the time, Wendy felt like the film um, treated them with some sensitivity in her situation, and um, and felt fine about it. So did Brenda. Um, Stevie's mother um, kept telling me that she only felt she could get about halfway through the film and then she started crying and couldn't finish it. And I talked to her several times, uh, encouraging her to watch it all the way through and she, she never felt like she could get through it. Um, but it was interesting because I would get calls from her occasionally in the years since then, like when the man she was living with passed away, she called me in tears over it. Um, I'm not saying I was a close confidant of hers, but for whatever reason, she felt like she wanted to talk to me um, among other people, I'm sure. And I, I kind of decided that she had made it all the way through the film. And, 
And, and, and I also decided that I, you know, people would ask me, like, why did she consent to be in this movie? You know, why would she want to be in this movie? And, and, and I, you know, my sort of, you know, two-bit psychological analysis of this is, is that I really felt like on some level she, this was her penance um, for what she had done as a mother when he was a child, that she felt on some, in some way, some duty, a need to kind of, if you will, confess her own sins. Even though she doesn't really quite do it, I think that by virtue of being in this film the way she is, it sort of is that, um, I felt. With Stevie, it was very complicated because he was in prison and we tried on several occasions to get prison authorities to let him watch the film and they would not let him watch it. But he would, he would receive correspondence from people who'd seen the film and write him about the film and write him about his life and he would correspond with them. Um, and guards who had seen the film, who would interact with him. And when he finally got out, I wanted to go down and show it to him in person, but it, at the time it happened, it was diff I didn't want to hold him up from seeing it, so I sent him the film and I said, if you want to wait, I, I, I will come down and watch it, but I don't want to prevent you, I don't want to make you wait if you want to see it. He said I wanted to see it, so I went, so I went ahead and sent it to him. And I had uh, I kept expecting to have this profound discussion with him about the film, and we never really had it. He he watched it, and he told me that it was okay, and it wasn't hoop dreams. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, it wasn't. It, it, it isn't hoop dreams. And he said, I was I was kind of expecting something more like hoop dreams, is what he told me. And I wasn't quite sure what he meant by that. And then I started to talk more with him about it, and he said, somebody's at the door, I've got to go. And that was the last thing we talked about with the film. At one point, I talked to Brenda about why did you agree to do this, and why were you so co courageously honest? And she, you know, she said that she feel, felt like there were other people like Stevie out there and other families like ours, and if this could somehow help anybody you know, that would be great. I, I do think that films, documentaries, especially ones in which you spend significant time with people over time, I hope, and I feel like it's happened sometimes on my films, um, that they become a, a, a therapeutic uh, enterprise, that, that, you know, we as filmmakers get something from them clearly. You know, they give over their lives in some way and, and, and trust us to tell their story in ways. I think what the film can give them is an opportunity to look at their lives in a different way, to see their lives in a significance that maybe they didn't see because someone, just simply because someone thought it was worthy of a story for a documentary. And I, and I think at its best, documentaries should encourage people to have that kind of reflection. And, and so in that sense, it has to change in some way. I know that for me, making this film was a complicated experience and, you know, and that's why the people who criticize it and, and vilify me for having made it, I understand that feeling because I was doing that some myself. So how can I begrudge them for feeling that way? But I do know that, and I, I'm not saying this says something great about me at all, but had I not made this film, I don't know that I would have been in his life to the degree I became in his life. I think making the film gave me more of a reason to try and be involved, not just for the film's sake, but also I like to think for you know his sake. And I'm not saying that I would have not been involved once I knew what was going on, but I realistically I can't imagine I would have had been there with the same degree of consistency and effort because I lived six hours away in Chicago and he lived in Southern Illinois and I'm a busy person. And so I don't know if it would have happened. I mean. Thanks very much to Steve James for bringing us this film. Thank you so much. <laughs>